get it started. I'd like to open the October 2nd, 2019 Groveland Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Um, tonight we have a continuation of application 2009-3 for 4 Said Wall Street Groveland Realty and Trust LLC, care of William Bailey. Request a comprehensive permit for provisions MGL 40B. 20-23 and 760 CMR 56.00 to construct 192 unit apartment units in four residential buildings, a clubhouse with related amenities such as a pool and associated way access ways, sidewalks, parking utilities and stormwater infrastructure located in the industrial zone. All right, tonight we have, um, let's start from the other side, Chris Goodwin. John Stokes, myself, Jason Norman, um, Kathleen Branson, and Town Council, Amy Quessel. I'll let you introduce Paul Haggerty. Paul Haggerty. And our um, administrator, um, Rebecca. I knew that one. <laughs> um, Tonight, we are going to review the traffic impact assessments. Um, we received a peer review from TEC, and um, I don't know if we have anything else to cover specifically beyond that right now. We didn't receive any other. We probably want to, we received a couple of architectural uh, proposals. Perfect. Yeah. So proposals. We'll look at the end. I'm yeah. just wondering if there, there was no, com are there any public comments or anything else that have come in since? Other than what we submitted already, no. I believe I still have the one that we will also read. How do we want to start this? Um, Suggestions? I would like the applicant maybe present what they want to do for traffic. And Quickly go and, then, yeah, and then have your consultant kind of go through his comments because we, we had some pretty um, substantial comments. So there needs some time, I think. Okay. <coughs> Good evening. So Joel Kahn here uh, with Equity Alliance. One thing, um, because of the changes in our do you want to move that so that they can see it on the screen, just to swing the tripod around a little bit, yeah, maybe? I think we all have a copy, so we don't necessarily need to see. Put it right here. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, just bring it in so it can be right. seen in the picture. It's okay. a two-person job. <coughs> yeah. That's it. That's all right. I'm fine with that. It's all right. Just so <laughs> they can get a sense of where, right. you know, if you want to point to something, it right it'll right be visible. I don't know why Rachel can't just do both at the same time. Yeah. I mean, Rebecca, I mean, so, I, you know. So anyway, good evening. So um, tonight you don't get to hear from me much tonight, but I just wanted to introduce our traffic engineer, Heather Monacup, who is the uh, senior project manager with GPI. And we'd like to start off this evening and let her present her report uh, in its entirely, and, uh, and then we can go from there. So with that, I'll sit down, Heather. And these work at the podium as well, right? Okay. Good evening. Um, I'm Heather Monica with Greenman Peterson, and we are the traffic engineers for the proposed project. Uh, we prepared a traffic impact and access study dated June 12, 2019 that was submitted for um, submitted to the town for review. Uh, it was a traffic study for 192 apartment units within four buildings. Um, and access to the site is currently The site is shown here on the um, handout in the shaded, somewhat yellow area as an extension off of Seawall Street. Uh, that will, Seawall Street will essentially become our site driveway to the sea, 
to the to the site. Uh, we looked at existing conditions, 2019. Uh, the study area included, and I'm going to work from west to east, uh, Washington Street at Salem Street, which has a flashing beacon, Salem Street at Seawall Street, and the um, A.W. Chesterton uh, driveway, which is a four-way unsignalized intersection, uh, Salem Street at Murray Ave and Uptech Ave, that is also, it's un there, each intersection is unsignalized. However, they are offset a little bit in a, in a good way so that the lefts do not conflict with each other, but we still studied it as a four-way intersection, which makes it a little bit more conservative. Um, and also uh, Salem Street at Staunton Road, and lastly, uh, Route 97 at Salem Street, which is an unsignalized intersection that recently had improvements to it that I'll get to in a minute. Um, within the study, we, we uh, looked at public transportation that's available in the area. Uh, we did traffic counts out there. We looked at the AM peak period from 7 AM to 9 AM. We looked at the PM, weekday PM peak period from 4 PM to 6 PM. And we also took a look at the Saturday midday peak hour from 11 AM to 2 PM. And we also took um, daily traffic volumes on Salem Street with a tube that counted traffic for um, the, the whole day period. So we got weekday and Saturday daily traffic volumes from there. Uh, what we do with that information is we collect the highest one hour of traffic in each of those three time periods, AM, PM, and Saturday. And that's what we analyze as part of the study. Uh, the counts were done in April, uh, on April 25th and April 27th for the Saturday. And uh, we have to look at some adjustment factors to make sure, well, at this time of the year, are traffic volumes lower than the rest of the year? Are they average or are they above average? Um, we found that April traffic counts were lower than average, so we actually had to adjust them upward by 5.7%. So we went ahead and did that to, um, to, to all the roadways, uh, to, to all the traffic volumes there on Salem Street. Uh, we also looked at collisions uh, <coughs> at all five study area intersections. At uh, Salem and Washington Street, there were five collisions uh, in the five-year period that we looked at from MassDOT available data. That data is available <coughs> from 2012 to 2016, so it lags a little bit. Um, in that period, there were five collisions over the five-year period at Washington Street and Salem Street, so that equates to about one collision per year. There were no collisions identified at the Salem, Seawall Street, and um, A.W. Chesterton Driveway. There were two collisions identified at Salem Street, Murray, and Uptech Ave. Uh, that is about 0.4 collisions per year. No collisions at Staunton Avenue, and um, the highest one was at Salem, uh, was at Route 97 at Salem Street. Over the five-year period, we found 32 reported collisions to mass, uh, on the mass DOT data. So that means that at that location for the time period from 2012 to 2016, um, the, the crash rate, it was higher than the statewide and district uh, four average. However, improvements have been made to that intersection through a mass DOT project. It was uh, project number 605114 that kind of reconfigured the intersection, pulled the right turn out, and that was implemented in order to um, address some safety problems. So beyond the study, we also looked at, uh, since the submission of the study, I should say, we also went and looked at local available at this intersection of uh, 97 and Salem Street. And what we found looking at the local data, which was from 2014 to present at the time, just about the summer, it was four and a half years of data. That um, uh, one thing I should mention is the improvements were under construction around 2016 into 2017, and I believe they were completed in 2017. Uh, so what we found, uh, this, this trend is kind of interesting. In 2016, there were 12 collisions at this location. Uh, based on the local data. Local data um, included the mass DOT stuff, which is a collision report with um, damage over $1,000. But when you look at local data, they also include any time a police officer is called to the location. So it's usually a little bit higher when you get your local data information. Uh, so in 2016, there were 12 collisions. 
2017-10 collisions. Now remember, that's when the construction was wrapping up. In 2018, there were five collisions. And in 2019, so far for the data that we had, is, was four collisions. So what we can see from that is that the collision trend does see, appear to be decreasing. Uh, to confirm that, obviously, we'd have to probably get the, the rest of the year's data as the year moves through. So I just wanted to add that bit of information that was not provided in the traffic study. So the other things that we looked at with existing conditions were vehicle speeds out there. Uh, and we also looked at sight distances at the driveway. We want to make sure that it's safe for people getting into the driveway and getting out of the driveway. Uh, the, the requirements exceed the, um, the sight distance lines out there, exceed the minimum requirements as set forth by ASHTO. <coughs> However, it requires that the, um, in this corner here, the Greenwood Auto Body, they park some cars in the right of way. Um, then out there, you see they're in front of the building and on the side. They do obscure sight lines. If those cars are out of the right of way or out of the sight triangle, um, you would have clear um, sight distances. There's some recommendations in TEC's letter um, about that that I'll get to in a minute or at the, at the end of my presentation after the traffic study. So that was the existing condition. So then we have to look at future conditions. We, um, for this project, we looked at an opening year condition of 2021 and a seven-year design horizon, which is consistent with the Mass DOT standards of 2026. So we looked at two different future conditions. We have to look at it without the project in place and with the project in place so we can get a comparison of the so that we can provide an impact of the project. So in order to get our traffic volumes to these future year conditions, we have to look at a couple things. We have to look at traffic growth in the area. So based on um, historical data of traffic volumes in the area, we have found that um, traffic is increasing since 2010 at a rate of 0.1% per year. However, to be conservative, we used a 1% growth rate per year. The other thing that we need to look at is are the, were there any projects in the area that have been approved and should be included in these numbers that maybe has not been built yet. Uh, what was identified through the town, through coordination with the town, was a Groveland self-storage facility. Uh, that, that site is not expected to generate a lot of traffic. No traffic study was submitted for the project, so we include that um, project in the, in the conservative background growth of 1%. So that's how we get to our uh, future conditions without the project in place. As mentioned, we also look at any roadway improvements that are happening. Is Salem Street going to be a four-way, <laughs> you know, four-way cross section or something? But that is not the case here. There's nothing in the area that is proposed besides the improvements that were just recently completed at um, the intersection of Route 97 and Salem Street. So now we want to know okay, we need to put our site here. How much traffic is this site going to generate? Well, for that, we look at national standards through the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the ITE Trip Generation Manual. And for this particular development, in particular, this new edition of the uh, Trip Gen Manual breaks things out. It's not just townhomes or condos or this. They, they break them up into how many levels, mid-rise, low-rise, um, what have you. So this particular site fell into Land Use Code 221, which is a multifamily housing mid-rise um, land use code. And what we found with that is that the 192 units that are um, analyzed in this traffic study will generate 65 weekday AM peak hour trips, 83 weekday PM peak hour trips, and 88 Saturday midday peak hour trips. So now we have to figure out where the traffic's going. So what we do for that is there is census data that shows people living in Groveland, where do they work? So we use this journey to work data. Um, so we figure out where the traffic's going based on travel patterns, um, where, th where they, you know, they live in Groveland, where are they working? And uh, through that, we distribute the traffic onto the roadway network. I have, um, although provided in the traffic study, I also brought this. This is our roadway network showing the traffic volumes that are expected. Um, AM with, with no nothing, PM in parentheses, and Saturday numbers in brackets. So as you can see, we distribute the traffic with 40% um, of the site traffic going south on Salem Street, 10% uh, going north on School Street, 10% going north on Washington Street, 25% south on Washington Street, and 15% east 
And when we do that, we use the synchro capacity analysis. We found that um, Salem Street at Washington Street uh, is level of service C or better, so that's acceptable movement, uh, acceptable operations. Um, the project is expected to have uh, two seconds or less delay at that intersection, impact at that intersection, and um, increases in queue length of, of one vehicle or less on each on each movement. Uh, the next in, uh, at the next intersection is our site driveway, Salem Street at our site driveway and the Chesterton driveway. Um, again, that too is level of service C, which is acceptable. Uh, VC ratios, which is your volume to capacity ratio. You know, where are you? You can imagine 1.0 is like full. Um, so the, the VC ratios are low under, um, under 1.0. Uh, obviously, we add more delay to this intersection because all of our site traffic is using this driveway. So obviously it increases a little, <coughs> it increases a bit, but still only um, an additional 14 seconds is expected uh, on delay uh, with queuing of one vehicle or less. Um, the other intersections, Murray at Uptack and Stanton, those are all level of service B or better, so operating even better than the other intersections with, the, with and without the project in place, queues of one vehicle. Um, and then the last intersection is Route 97 at Salem Street. So that, pro that today, the um, eastbound left turn lane to head north on School Street, is it has long delays, um, whether, whether the project's in or not. Uh, this particular project is expected to add, and you can see it here in the numbers, only five at most five, so although that delay is long today, we're expecting to add another vehicle queue to, to the approach, but again, it's only, it's only five vehicles that are expected uh, to use that. So although there are long delays, we, we won't be adding um, too much to that. Let's see here. Um, PEC did prepare a review letter for the project, and I know they're here to, um, to go over it, but uh, in summary, they, uh, they seem to be in general agreement with the methodology and the findings of our study. Um, there are some things that we need to address. Uh, they looked at a different way to do seasonal adjustment, but their number came out a little bit lower, so they said, okay, your, your study's fine, you're uh, more conservative. They also pointed out the point that the cars are uh, parked in that right of way that do inhibit sight lines. So we do need to work with that landowner to uh, figure out what the right of way lines are and if a sight line easement is needed or some agreement, um, we, we need to get those cars out of the right of way so that we have clear sight lines out there. Uh, TEC pointed out that we did not provide uh, turn lane warrants at the site driveway. Uh, they concurred that they are not met. We concur with them. They are not, the turns at the site driveway are not warranted based on the volumes. Um, they also asked for a signal warrant analysis. So upon getting their letter, we did do a signal warrant analysis at the site driveway. It does not meet any of the volume warrants. Uh, we will be responding to their comment letter formally and assist will be provided in that for their review. Um, but they did make a couple recommendations uh, that maybe a sidewalk be provided out front and a bus stop area for children waiting for the bus and potentially maybe even a crosswalk across uh, Salem Street. So we're interested in to hear what the board has to say about those recommendations. Uh, TEC's comment letter further went on to comment on the site plan itself. And um, not going to get into that much, but they had some comments on um, access and egress to Nelson Street, snow storage, fire access, truck circulation, parking modifications, pavement marking and signing, those types of things. Um, looking through the letter, we don't see any issue with addressing all of these comments. We will work with the fire department to make sure that the buildings are properly protected, but the civil drawings are going to be advancing through the process, and they too will be discussed at a future meeting. So um, I, I think that's when we'll talk more deeply about the, the, the site comments. But I know that TEC is here, so I'm sure you either want to hear from them or I can answer any questions that you have at this point. Anybody have any specific questions nope. in that yeah. scope? Or do we want to move on to no, I'd like to hear from TEC too. and then we can Sounds get good. back? That's what I figured. <coughs> Thank you. Questions after. <coughs> uh, 
I'm Robbie Flynn. Mm -hmm. um, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Sam Gregorio. I'm the Senior Design Engineer in TEC's Transportation Planning Group. Um, following up on all, actually a lot of what Heather said, and just to start off uh, for you know, members in the audience and obviously members watching on television, um, I work for the town in this sense. So I review it and the traffic um, in terms of the town's interests. So just so you know that where I come from is a point of did the applicant follow industry standards when looking at the study? Did the applicant provide enough information as part of their traffic study? Um, information like that, so whether it gets into certain types of whatever product it is, that's kind of out of my purview. It's I'm more of um, the traffic that's laid out on the paper and how that actually fits with industry standards, uh, where I hold no bias against or for the project and what's and whatnot. Um, Similar to what uh, Heather said, uh, TC reviewed uh, the traffic study that was submitted, uh, and similar to what she said, we found that they concurred uh, with general industry standards for both MassDOT, um, the town, and general, uh, uh, different instance, uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers for instance, the trip, something that, again, we would use ourselves doing a traffic study. Um, so we found that all the objects of the traffic study generally conform uh, to those standards. Um, I know one of the usual questions that usually comes up is regarding the amount of trips and generally compared to the amount of units that are on the site, uh, 192 units as a study would um, project. Uh, although I know obviously the site might have less depending on how the board uh, operates. But um, when we talk about the number of trips, uh, IG trip generation manual is a manual that holds thousands and thousands of traffic counts, uh, developments across the country. So it's the numbers that are projected out of that do come from a uh, historical data, not from like 50 years ago, but you know, very recent. Um, and it gets updated every couple of years just to make sure that the most updated information is available. And to think about, I know one of the usual questions that comes up is the amount of trips versus the units. Um, so in a residential development, one of the things that we also look for is knowing that a residential development, not everybody leaves at the same time in the morning. So we look at the peak hours part of the study, uh, what GPI did. And so the general peak hour in the morning over a couple hour period that's when you start getting up to the amount of trips that really kind of equal the amount of units that are in there. Um, some people leave at six in the morning, some people live at seven. Um, some people don't work, some people work night shifts. So it really comes into play like that. Um, so in a sense of the actual traffic study and the results that come out of the traffic operations, we generally concur with the findings that there's generally no operational difference at the intersections we'll call outside of the 97 versus uh, Salem Street intersection. 11 service C is typical and actually very, very good on a arterial roadway with side streets. Uh, the side street approaches being level service C or better. Um, obviously we understand that there's degraded, we'll call it degraded levels of service now at the 97 Salem Street intersection, even without the project. Um, the worst movement at that intersection, and I think Heather had brought it up as well, uh, five cars over the course of an, a peak hour added to that movement really doesn't add a lot of new traffic or add a lot of new delay to that approach. Um, the traffic study does show that there's a jump in delay. So as you look at the comparison of a no build versus build on that approach, it does look high. But that's just to say that when you get a volume to capacity ratio, I think she mentioned as well, over one, where basically you're at capacity, every one added car jumps that delay. So as you look at that, it's gonna look a lot more skewed than in real life situation that will be there. Five cars, it's one car every 12 minutes added to that. So when you think of it that way, it's obviously not adding 100 seconds delay to an approach, for instance. Um, <coughs> our major concern uh, when it comes to traffic is obviously, and, and again, Heather mentioned it, the driveway um, as it approaches out of Salem Street and the site distance looking to the left. Um, uh, one of the major components that we would uh, still like to see is obviously where that right of way line is. Um, right now, if the cars can legally park in that area based on where the right of way is, the site lunch could be still blocked to something that's below the minimum standards for what we have for the speed of the roadway. Uh, so finding out where that right of way line is obviously still a major component that we'd like to see. Um, and with that, how that gets addressed, uh, obviously um, that's up to the applicant of how they wanna do that. I've suggested in our report, of one option is a site line easement that would have to be worked out with um, the, the property owner. Um, it's their land, they have a right to use it as they see fit um, inside their own private property. So but that's something that the applicant can work with them on. But there's other options too uh, for how they could address that in terms of, but 
um, I'll leave that to them on how they, they feel fit and we can comment on that time. Um, the other items I think she mentioned mostly start getting into more of the site plan aspect. Um, the comments that are in the uh, report based on the site plan are related to traffic only. So as the site plan progresses, I'm sure there'll be more comments in a peer review process. These ones are ones that we saw on the initial uh, versions and related to traffic just to get the, um, the applicant in a position of the things that we'll be looking for and added. So by no means is these are the only comments that will happen on the site plan. Uh, they're only the ones that are traffic related. Um, um, leading back to that, um, although it's the town uh, direction, we do have the sidewalk across the road. It would be uh, TZ would like to see that opportunity to provide that cr crossing across the way to connect to the sidewalk to give that, knowing that this will be obviously a larger amount of pedestrians that could potentially come out of one area as opposed to the one person that might be coming out of a driveway from a house. Um, and then obviously with potential for a lot of children that comes out of one particular property as well, a place to stand on the side of the road, um, how that gets worked out with the town, whether it's a sidewalk platform or something more advanced, uh, but just something to allow the uh, children to be off the roadway. Obviously, it's not a lot of room out there, and especially because we also have to keep them inside what's at the public right away in that sense, or on the pri their private property as opposed to uh, the abutters. Uh, with, with that, um, I'll take any questions from the board, but I'm sure as things come up, I'll still be able to answer uh, from anything coming to residents or the board as they come up later in the meeting. Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah, well, I just have a question about, um, I'm not, I know that <coughs> DPI was going to do a signal, sorry, I just want to get my terminology right. Thank you. A <laughs> signal warrant analysis, ha and have you, you said you've done that. We've done that. So have you shared that with TEC at all? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, or take the, oh, yeah. yeah. So we have prepared it and we discussed it with the team, but we hadn't submitted it because I, I didn't want to just send it in an email. I thought we would send it with a formal response to comments. Okay. And just to put perspective on that, that doesn't mean we were wanting a signal at that location. It's purely to see the traffic impact of this location. Does it warrant one? And then we go from there if it is warranted or if it's not. Um, just to give options later um, to know. Okay. I just wanted to see if you had seen it, what you thought, if, if you had any comments on it, but you obviously haven't seen it yet, so never mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, the letter is dated uh, September 25th, I think, so it was just like a week ago, so it, I thought that maybe we haven't had time to formally respond. I thought so. I just wanted to verify that you hadn't, if you had seen it and if you had any comments um, outside of a formal comment, that's all. I know I'll have more of that. Any other question? On Not right now. <coughs> Not right now. Nothing else? No. I have a few more questions. Yeah. You want me to ask them? Yes. No. Um, <laughs> so with regard to the Nelson Street um, <coughs> access, if that access becomes part of the overall project, not just emergency access, will that change anything significantly with regard to traffic? Outside of the actual intersection, and for purposes of, um, if anybody doesn't know that exactly what the question is being asked, um, it looks like on this original version of the site plan that there's potentially could have access that comes through Nelson from the site. Doesn't mean there is, it just means that the roadway does connect through, uh, and there wasn't, there didn't appear to be a gate or anything like that on the site plan. That being said, if, for instance, there is traffic from the site that were to come down that location, other than the site driveway intersection at um, and then the adjacent Nelson. Mm -hmm. Nothing else would generally change. Those locations are right next to each other. Um, traffic patterns, whether or not there are people are going to be heading down versus Washington, they head towards East Boxford, that hook up with 495 over there. <coughs> um, they would still turn, they would just do it in the other driveway instead. Um, and then um, you had noted with regard to the parking. Um, I thought that the your last comment was was extremely interesting. The fact that they have approximately thirty two percent more parking than they need. Um, does that 
So you came to that conclusion in paragraph 27, but then paragraph 22, you had mentioned that um, the site plans don't provide a layout for the podium parking. So sure, I, I don't understand. There was a number provided for how many parking spaces would be, okay. although the site plan itself didn't, you couldn't, I couldn't see through the building, so I can guess how many are in there okay. just by subtraction, but um, the podium parking comment was more for without knowing exactly how many spaces and where they are, mm -hmm. how would people turn around? There might be a plan that has that. Mm -hmm. It's just that it was in front of our, was in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. so, so I thought that your, your recommendation in 27 was, was very good, the fact that they could reduce the parking to reduce the impervious surfaces, but keep banked areas in case in the future they needed them. Um, and then I think my, um, maybe my last question might be, um, the, um, on 23A, you recommend um, the installation of a new stop sign um, along Sewell Street at the intersection of Salem Street. Would that have, um, would that, the location of that need permission from the abutter? If it's on the public right of way, no. Okay. And can um, it be on the public right of way? Or does it have to oh be Oh, yeah, it would be on the public right of way. Okay. Um, and and then, it would be placed okay. by standard. There's standards exactly where mm -hmm. it needs to be placed. So. Okay. And then um, with regard to the sight line easement with the abutter, um, what if that's not possible? What if they cannot get that and those cars remain there all the time? Um, if that's, and uh, this is assuming that the right, where the right-of-way line is, so the, the assumption yeah. of this question would be the right-of-way line is further closer to the road and therefore a car could legally be parked up yeah. against that and block a sight line going to the left. Um, if that wasn't the case, there, there are other remedies. Okay. Uh, most of them would have to involve trying to get the speed to be lower. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, like, for instance, a speed limit change is the alternative because speed limits have to be are regulated by the state, not the town. Um, but there are opportunities, for instance, if at a, like a worst case in that sense for speed, I guess, uh, an advisory speed or a safety zone, those can be done uh, through the town process as opposed to the state. Um, there's other things in terms of traffic coming that could get uh, what we perceive to be the 80 per percentile speed or at worst case the speed limit on that road I believe it's 30 off the top of my head I can't remember um, so if they it might be 35 I'd, okay. it's 35 and goes down to 25 at the end yeah if they um, can't um, would a, would an option be to use the Nelson Street access? Would that be a better option? It, it could be, but it, again, that's up to how the applicant designs their site. Mm -hmm. So at that time, we would comment on then. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's also opportunity. That, I mean, I, without a site plan in front of me, I don't know where the right-of-way line on the other side is. But if, right. for instance, they could shift the driveway a, a foot mm -hmm. over and extend the site line dozens of feet. So it's really up to how the site plan's laid out. Um, and it's hard for me to comment on things that may not have been drawn yet. So, okay. with that. <laughs> um, and Mr. Chairman, I if think that, that's it for me. Uh, if I could just respond to that, when we do our formal response to comments, we can show that area with the uh, with the um, right of way line shown, and we can even show a sight line triangle to show whether or not it goes over the right of way line, and that can be submitted formally. Perfect. One, since we've brought it up a couple of times now, one question in regards to probably you. The Nelson, I believe the Nelson Street access was intended to just be for uh, emergency access or um, other planned access, not for general. No, it's not intended for general public, and it will be a gated access yeah. appropriately to what uh, the town will permit for that. But the purpose is not to make that. Uh, we also, again, uh, Heather will provide it. But we have confidence that the right-of-way question of visibility is not an issue as well, too. And we'll provide that as well, too, to that issue. And if I could just add one other comment, I appreciate the fact that one could consider whether or not a reduction in parking is appropriate purely on a mathematical basis. But there's also other data out there, and we can provide that at a later hearing that mm -hmm. goes to the issue of why we believe we need that amount of parking to provide the adequate uh, uh, mount for the property to make it successful, but that's uh, something we can carry. And lastly, in podium parking, I've constructed a similar building. There are 40 spaces that are underneath the building, um, and that's marking them out correctly with pedestrians and turning movements and what have you. And we'll provide a copy of that plan to Heather to submit as well that shows that. Okay. Thank you.
regular um, well I definitely have a couple of issues so I'm just trying I wanted to see if I could insert them when they made sense but barring that um, so I just want to go back to the initial um, letter that the town had submitted initially to the applicant about you know site concerns every, everybody in town sort of looked at um, what might be going on at the site what could potentially happen at the site and so the town had come back with a list of items some of them civil some of them police fire that kind of thing but some of them were traffic related so I just wanted to make sure that we sort of address them in a formal environment so that the town knows that we have addressed the issue or at least heard about the issue so if you don't mind can you if I tell you what they are can you see if you talk to because I think you guys probably reviewed it but I just want to sort of put it out there so um, one of their concerns was about uh, the need for improved pedestrian access in and out of the site and pedestrian connection to adjacent streets and sidewalks which I know you sort of addressed in your letter but um, I just if you want to maybe Say anything on that? Sure. In, in, in a peer review sense, uh, our minimum recommendation would be to provide at least, for instance, the pedestrian crossing at the driveway that gets into the sidewalk on the other side. Um, how that happens based on the speed of the roadway and whether or not there needs to be um, additional enhanced pedestrian, whether it's like a flashing beacon, is completely up to the, how the town wants to do it. Um, the pedestrian crosswalk itself uh, would generally be sufficient, ho however, based on um, the concerns, I guess, of the town is whether that goes further from that. In terms of other locations along Salem Street, which I think is what you're getting at as part of that as well. Um, again, in a peer review sense, it's, um, it's a really a decision between the applicant and the town of how they want to do other pedestrian accommodations throughout. I mean, as long as they provide a pedestrian accommodations to themselves, um, that's really um, where they're, um, I guess, I don't want to use the fourth, but their direct mitigation has to, that has to address uh, pedestrian access to other um, roadways doesn't necessarily fall under their a requirement. It could still be a recommendation, but that would really come from the town out of a peer review sense. Okay, thank you. And then um, I think there was one other traffic issue. Um, the big question is really about Sewell Street. Sewell Street is a private street, not public. Um, it said their concern was it would need will need significant upgrades and widening including the sidewalk so this is more of a question I think for all those involved about because it is a private way and is there how does that get addressed well if I could just add though that when the mass housing came to us and told us about the letter and that question we did produce documentation back to mass housing with copies to Rebecca in the town that showed that we had the right and that there was uh, and and showed that in the documentation and support for that so that has been provided previously to the town regarding that regarding sidewalks we intend to again we have no interest in making it unsafe for our residents so we have no issue and have already um, provided for spark, uh, sidewalks throughout the site and have no objection whatsoever and will work with the police department and public safety to deal with the issue of a crossing. We too have concerns to make sure that our, we can get access to the sidewalk. So we are in agreement with that as being a concern as well too. Okay, thank you. So the applicant will be widening Sewell Street? Well, we need to widen it. What we provided for you was the documentation. We have the rights to road and the rights to make it acceptable that, to the town. Yes. So will you be private. widening it is my question. Yes. The answer is yes. Yes. disorganized. Sorry. So if you can um, <coughs> So um, my question, I have another question. Obviously, I think it came up in, as part of TEC's review. It also came up uh, just as I was reading it and also part of the town's concerns was about uh, traffic signage at the location. So I think 
Amy addressed it briefly about a stop sign. Um, but what else would TEC recommend, I guess, for traffic signage, not only at Sewell Street, but any, I'm assuming you'll probably want to see something inside the um, site as well. Sure. Directional, it, whatever. Yeah, so at, at the intersection, again, out at Salem Street, um, stop sign, stop line, something that would, at, at a full site plan level, would probably be in there. Obviously, it just hasn't got to that point yet. Right. Um, inside the site, uh, we would fully expect there to be a pavement marking and, tra and traffic sign plan that comes as part of that, or at least on one of the plan pages that would appear. Um, again, I don't think the site plans have progressed to that point yet. Uh, so this was to make sure that certain our peer review wanted to note, based on the at least the early versions of what was uh, provided as the site plan, to know that there are certain items that we would like to see at certain locations, um, minor street to major drive aisles, for instance, where you'd want a stop sign on those, um, different types of any time of pedestrian crossing on the sidewalks within the site, at a non -con at a non control location, basically not at a stop sign to have pedestrian signage and advanced signage for that, things that would typically be part of a site plan. Um, again, I just don't believe at this time they at that time they had the the set up to that point yet. Right. Okay. I am, I believe it will be. There, so. Yes. I, and, and just to add to that, sidewalks with handicap ramps appropriately and markings across roads and even speed limit signs to to make sure that we in fact are not interested in people racing around the site and causing any discomfort. So all those signs, again, uh, you know, he's correct, will be advanced as we get to that point in time. Um, in there. And there were other comments from about the civil plans and again we have a civil peer review coming up. They should <coughs> not be put aside and we will make sure that we discuss those and bring those up ourselves to deal with each item on that list when we get to the specifics of the civil design. Okay. The other question I had, and I was hoping maybe you could address, um, I know you sort of said it in your letter, but I thought maybe we could have a, a discussion about um, the fire access issues. So there were um, a few items, number 19 jumps out at me quickly here, but um, amongst others, but buildings number three and four do not provide access to two sides of the building, which is insufficient for Town of Groveland Fire Department <coughs> standards. This would require the use of ground ladders, which are insufficient for use on the sides of the building as proposed. The applicant shall coordinate with the fire department and revise the site plan accordingly to meet the request of the fire department. So, and then you also talk about, um, Oh, actually, it was garbage truck. I was thinking it was fire truck. <laughs> but I, w I do want to make sure. I definitely have a concern, and I know a lot of people in town have a concern about whether fire trucks can get in there, can access the site, can do the turnarounds that they need to do, where they need to do them. That makes the most sense. So I know that something on the site plan might officially qualify, but if TEC has any recommendations that they think might make it flow better or anything like that. Sure. And when the those particular items when it comes to the actual layout uh, as part of the civil site plan is when a lot of that will get done uh, because as the buildings are get laid down to an exact position, parking spaces get laid down to exact position, we know that whatever was on that original plan might change. And so we usually would wait till that. And usually part of that site plan comes with a page that has the truck turning templates on it for the town's uh, largest fire truck um, and for uh, in our sense, we're, as we recommended, a, a garbage truck as well, depending on where the dumpsters are. So again, a dumpsters haven't been located yet, therefore there wouldn't have been a plan yet. Oh, right. Um, so, but in a sense, the, the fire department does review, I believe, the site plans. Um, the recommendations that we have in our letter generally mirror what we saw in their, at least our initial letter. Um, each town's a little different. So whereas the town of Groveland likes to see at least two sides of a building able to get accessed, um, Georgetown might not be the same. I should know. I live in Georgetown, but <laughs> sorry, I don't know the answer to that one. But uh, <coughs> um, we expect those to be addressed at, at that next site plan level when more things get locked down into an exact uh, location. Um, and at that time, we'll, we'll go through that part of the review in more in detail. Okay. Thank you.
Just make a comment too, is I know that we have a civil review, and we are certainly because those were advanced. You know, it's like last time we met, we did the fire department was here. We did provide turning meeting discussions at the mm -hmm. time, but in all fairness, we didn't provide them to this particular peer review. Um, and as we go through civil, we have no problem in coming back and revisiting and inviting the two parties back again, sort of as a follow up to what as the plan advances to then go back and say, were these things met? Did that happen? I mean, we're, we're, we, we have no issue with that, and we are working, as we did said last time, with the fire department to make sure that this is safe. So, I'm just sort of going, I was going through my notes, honestly, and going back to things that we said, oh, let's talk about that during traffic. I know. So while we're here doing traffic, I just sort of want to make sure we check those boxes. And, and I will forward to both of these parties the turning movements that were done on a preliminary basis just for their security. And the fire department access is going to be discussed at a later date, as I recall. Is that correct? With the civil, again, we advanced our discussions last time with the fire department. It stated what they were concerned about. And as we get to civil and we work through the issues that are on the list, the answer is yes, will be addressed as part of that process. Okay. Is there any, um, I'd like to open it up to public comment if anybody wants to address mainly traffic focused issues. Okay. Michael Wood, 8 School Street. Um, so I read through the report a couple times and um, I'm kind of underwhelmed by it. Uh, Listening to some of the presentations, there's some pretty fancy numbers and precise, impactful numbers. 14 seconds extra at Washington Street, five extra vehicle delays at, at Salem Street in 97. Um, but the real world problem is trying to get through Georgetown, trying to get through uh, Groveland at peak hours, right? Has anybody ever tried to get through Groveland Square at 5 o'clock or 4 o'clock? Adding 60 cars, 70 cars to that is going to be abysmal. Has anyone tried to get through Georgetown Square at 6 a.m., 7 a.m.? Adding traffic to that is going to be abysmal. Realistically, there's three ways to get out of Groveland, right? Salem Street into Bradford, School Street into Georgetown, School Street into Haverhill. When you start adding numbers like this to those streets that are already terrible to get through, the quality of life is going to be impacted. Has anyone tried to go to 95 or to 495 at 5.30, 6 in the morning? You would think that there'd be nobody on the road, right? Because it's early. Nobody wants to get up that early. I was on 93 at 5.30 this a.m., and it was stopped for miles. Just trying to get to the highway is crazy from Groveland. This type of project is going to make that worse. So I would urge this board to take that into consideration. While these numbers of 14 seconds here, five vehicle additional here, that doesn't tell the whole story. The whole story is trying to get to your job through Georgetown to get to 95 or go home from 95 through Georgetown to get into Groveland or to try to come from 95 through Groveland to get into Haverhill at 5 o'clock, at 4 o'clock, at 6 o'clock. If you look at that traffic, it's all the way up School Street, right? And I see it every day because I live behind downtown. It's there, right? If you try to go to 95 to get to Burlington at 530 in the morning, which again, you would think nobody's on the road, it's packed. That is the concern that a lot of people have, that the traffic is already hard to get through in Groveland. The speeding is hard to deal with in Groveland. The cops, they're at their wits because they don't have enough people to p police the area. Now you're going to add 192 units. You're going to add 70, 80 more cars a day. We don't have the personnel to take care of this. That has to be addressed. So I urge the board to consider that when they're making their recommendations to grant the permits or what they're going to do with this type of project because that, in my estimation, is impactful 
And even though these reports are very good, and I'm sure that people are very good at their jobs, I think it's very undertelling of what their real impact is going to be. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment? It's not. Um, traffic, traffic is usually very popular. <clears throat> um, I'm actually going to hold off on the, I think we have two um, written comments. Neither, there's one that focuses a little bit on traffic, but it's, um, I'll re probably read that one tonight, but the one from uh, Deborah Webster I'll hold off on because it's, it's more focused on civil. Um. Right. Um, this e email to Rebecca from Michael Wood. <laughs> yes. Um, you want me to read? It's basically what I just said. Yeah. Well, the tra that's what I'm saying. The traffic side parts are basically what you just said. I'm not sure if there's anything else in particular. I didn't realize that was. <laughs> I just read the, the actual full name. <laughs> I only said it was the Michael before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. And there um, were no other written comments? No, only the one from so far from Deborah Webster, which doesn't really cover traffic. That's more civil, um, and um, in regards to deeds and stuff. So we'll wait on that one until we cover more of those. Okay. Any other? Can I ask a follow up? Um, yep. For Mr. Fabrera. So the the. The peak hours where, where you have, you know, 83 and 65 new trips, but there's 400 parking spaces. Is, isn't that, isn't there a big discrepancy? I know it's only the peak hours, but how do you, is there a way to figure out how many trips per day? Well, sure, and it doesn't actually sound like it's working, but all right. Um, the traffic study would have had a number for so we the, <laughs> those numbers were provided in the traffic study and the daily number is for a, for an entire day 24 hour period on a weekday is 1040 vehicle trips again it's total in and out um, so half in and half out so what's that 520 in 520 out um, and on a Saturday it's 940 daily trips again and that includes the peak Include, yeah. 24 okay. hour period. Okay. So in relation to parking spaces that would go. Mm -hmm. um, again, the peak, peak hour for an object like the AM peak hour, for instance, where it was 65 <laughs> trips. Um, <coughs> some people leave at six to seven, some people leave from seven to eight, some people leave from eight to nine, some people don't leave mm -hmm. uh, because maybe mm -hmm. they're a stay at home parent or they work nightly hours or they telecommute or so that's generally why the trip number doesn't necessarily equal the unit count Got for it. instance in the peak hour where you expect everybody to go to work in mm -hmm. the morning for instance in terms of parking spaces um, the par parking spaces are generally based off of a zoning number um, of say one and a half or two spaces per unit assuming that for instance a, a, a family of three is probably gonna have two cars mm -hmm. for instance a, a studio apartment one person living is only getting one car so based on their bedroom counts and like that, this is how we get to the parking okay. number. Uh, as a, uh, whereas people leave to go do things, to go market gas, whatever, different parts of the day. So is the afternoon peak hours, is, is the trips always higher than the morning? No, uh, depending on the land use. Um, okay. Resident units are usually more spread out um, because most people, although they live in the same place, they work in different places. Mm -hmm. Whereas if this, for instance, was gonna be an office, the trip generation would show that the amount of employees almost equals the amount of trips in the morning because everybody ends up showing to work to work at nine mm -hmm. to five as opposed to that. Um, so that's kind of where that comes yeah. from. Okay. Thank you. I have sort of a follow-up question to that, I guess. 
So one of the concerns um, that I have that I've heard is about the fact that Chesterton is directly across the street. And so Chesterton, last I had heard, now this could have changed, this was last they were in maybe a couple of years ago. Um, I thought they had either two or three shifts. I thought it was three shifts that they had coming in. I thought it was standard shifts, you know, seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven. So at those peak hours, just like what you were saying is that everyone shows up for work at seven and however many employees there are at that particular time show up at work. So I'm a little concerned about all these employees coming in at seven, all these people trying to leave at seven, and now you really have sort of a log jam right at that intersection. Yeah. And same at night oh, sure. as well. And, um, and school buses at three o'clock. A lot of it depends on the exact shift hours, but for instance in the morning, I'll use the morning case the example at the moment, um, where everybody, if a typical office, for instance, um, without me knowing the exact hours that they operate at the moment. Um, if they had a shift that started, for instance, at 8 o'clock, everybody would be entering from the main line roadway. Those movements are almost no conflict uh, because the left turn in a little bit more, uh, but there's only about 200 or 300 cars, I believe, on that roadway at a, during that peak hour. There's a, that's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of opportunity for someone to be able to turn left in there. There might be a queue. Every couple minutes, someone might back up. Might be two cars, but that will get it rid, be gone pretty quickly, on a roadway that doesn't have that only has about 300 cars worth of volume in each direction. Um, so, people coming in, yes, it will cause a potential backup on the site, their site. Um, so there's an extended queue on that. That's their problem, and usually in a development sense, you accept that as delay for you, but not necessarily the main line. Um, in that sense, part of their capacity analysis was the operations at that intersection. The traffic counts were done showing in and out movement from that driveway as well across the way. Um, and based on what the traffic study showed, which we would concur, the levels, the operations are generally acceptable. A level service C, uh, which is somewhere between 20 to 30 seconds delay per vehicle, which is not a lot for a side street approach. Um, the main line would still be <coughs> operating generally at level service A, which is basically free flow. And that takes into consideration, you know, school buses at those times as well? Yes, yeah, so the traffic count would have had counted every type of car. Um, <laughs> the analysis takes into account a heavy, heavy vehicle factor. So say if there's five trucks or six buses that run down the roadway, those get added into a factor inside that capacity analysis in the, um, the industry standard version of the software that we use to do that. Um, so every time there's a truck, it makes it a little bit worse. It accounts for a truck as... I forget the exact number, but I want to say it's like 1.9, but I probably have that wrong. <laughs> uh, without knowing the exact number, uh, the basic idea would be like a truck would equal like 1.2 cars, for instance, right. in that analysis uh, for how many trucks there happens to be. Um, and that knows all the algorithms and equations that are based from the capacity analysis <laughs> manuals that we use. And they're usually they're offered by the federal government, the, HC, the highway capacity manual. Um, takes into account for those equations that trucks are slower, trucks are bigger, trucks are wider. And that's what those factors generally come from when it's trying to equalize what a truck means to versus a passenger car. Another thing, if I could add, um, it is, just as Tim said, the, um, there, it's an office across the street in residential on our side. Um, if they were two, if we were proposing an office on the other side, it might be a little more on a single roadway. Now you have everybody trying to come in at once and everyone trying to leave at once. These almost complement each other as in the morning people are entering the office and exiting our site. Um, so you don't have the, on the one lane road, two people trying to jockey for a seat going left and is there a gap and can I see through that person? Uh, <coughs> when, when the traffic is trying to get into Chesterton, we're waiting on our site driveway, right? And trying to see if there's acceptable gaps. And then when we're trying to get in, they're waiting on their driveway. You know what I mean? We're not both waiting on the same street trying to get into our roadway or into our respective driveways. Right. I'm just sort of envisioning what it might look like, mm -hmm. right, if we're sort of talking about this project. So, you know, now you have all these cars coming out of Sewell Street. You have cars going into Chesterton, but you also have, if they're doing the three shifts, right, so now you have people coming in on at 7 and people leaving at 7. 
So now you have them coming in, now you have the people going out of Chesterton, now you have the people coming out of Sewell Street, and if we're talking about maybe doing a crosswalk there and pedestrians and a bus stop, and I just feel like it's all going to log jam right there. At and I do know that, like, a little further down Salem Street, the bus comes at 7. So I'm like, okay, that's like prime time, and that's really going to lock everything up. And, so. of course, when a bus comes, everybody has to stop, right? So or, it's right. as if the red light was up and everyone needs to Agreed, stop. Agreed, but I, yes. I'm just um, sort of trying to think it through. Absolutely. And just know that we didn't use fictitious numbers for Chesterton. Right. We actually counted that driveway. Okay. And when we look at the traffic study, why we count for two hours is because we try to find the peak amount of traffic. Because um, the peak hour is, I have them written down here, it's I think 70. 7.45 to 8.45 is the peak hour of traffic. Mm. That's not to say that at 7 to 8 there isn't traffic. It's just maybe a little bit lighter. You know what I mean? So we want to look at the absolute worst time, that one hour. That's that's the highest amount of traffic. Yeah, so I was and thinking so it's like yeah. 6.45 to 7.15 because yeah. now you got the bus coming at the same yeah. time. So that's, you know, people coming in, people leaving Chesterton, same with the site, you know, so people are coming in and out at the same time. And the the peak hour there um, along the quarter, and it could have something to do with Chesterton, right? Quarter of eight. Well, it starts at eight, and it's not a coincidence, you know, like right. people are coming in and going out at this particular time. And the recommendation when it comes to, again, in the site plan uh, process, uh, the crosswalk, any crosswalk that gets built would be as close to the intersection as possible. The closer it is, the safer it is, because that means everybody can see it. Right. Um, and that's the case in pretty much any cross, except if it's really mid-block. That's the case for most things. You don't usually see crosswalks, let's say, 40 feet away from the intersection. You might see the one mid-block, which is a different type of scenario, but anyone that's intersection-related, it's usually right there, and it's purposefully for sight distance purposes because you want the driver, every driver to be able to see the ped sitting on, the, waiting on the ramp. At the, they'll, they'll see the guy in the crosswalk, but obviously the ramp, more important if someone's waiting. And assuming the sight line issue gets resolved as well, that'll probably help too, right? Yeah. And in terms of a crosswalk, that particular sight line doesn't actually match a, a pedestrian or a crosswalk. Different speed, different location, whereas you're not wa waiting for a car driving 35 down the roadway. When you pull out, 35 mile an hour car covers 100 feet in about two and a half seconds. A ped takes 15 seconds to do that. So. <laughs> um, the sight line, that particular sight line issue doesn't necessarily roll into this crosswalk, although I would say that you'd want the crosswalk on the first away from that sight distance issue, not so much necessarily for our driveway, but for people coming down the road from potentially the blocked area, which I believe is still to the left, even on the straightaway part. Yeah, there's like a, an incline there, so when you're coming up over that hill, if, you don't, if you're not paying attention, which somebody's on their phone because nobody's paying attention anymore, they come along and, you know, there's the school bus, everything's happening like sort of all at once. And um, so I, I'm sure there's a way to mitigate it. I'm just trying to figure out how to get there. That's all. Yeah, we, we noted that um, the curve in our site distance table, um, obviously barring any uh, vehicles impeding sight lines, it was the vertical curve that, that impedes. So if we look at the crosswalk location, we'll have to take into account and make sure that stop and sight distance can absolutely be met. Uh, for the for the crosswalk. Okay. Thank you. I have a, a just a general question in regards to uh, mm -hmm. traffic lights or um, lights around the crosswalks and stuff. Um, well, first, besides just volume, are there other considerations that would trigger those kinds of things to be recommended? Um, is there um, anything? Sure. So, Federal Highway has a general. I don't want to say it's a standard because it's not obviously law, but they have a guidelines uh, for pedestrian crossings at uncontrolled locations. And, um, it provides recommendations based on, for instance, the depending on the volume of the roadway over the course of a day, the ADT, uh, the speed of the roadway, um, the width of the roadway, multiple two lanes, three lanes, four lanes, um, and it provides countermeasure recommendations for each of those. So we would generally cite to, to, uh, any applicant to look at that or ourselves, if we were designing something, we'd be looking at that. Um, so, if, like, for instance, I'll use an example. Um, a 50-mile-an-hour roadway, um, you see obviously on the side of the roadways, the flashers that flash really quickly, they're called uh, rectangular rapid yeah. flashing beacons because that's exactly what they are. <laughs> um, 
at a 50 mile an hour roadway, even if it's two lanes and a short crosswalk, we wouldn't recommend that there because someone driving at 50 miles an hour, that light doesn't, 50 miles an hour is 100 feet and a little over a second of travel. So you have to be able to see that those lights from a very far distance in order to be able to stop. And that 50 miles doesn't really give you that opportunity to stop if there's any type of change in a straight roadway, if there's a curve or anything. So for that, we might do something like a, a hybrid traffic signal beacon. Um, you'll see one of those, for instance, in um, North Andover across from Merrimack, the ones with the, the triangle, the inverted triangle light that blinks only when the ped's there. Um, again, it's dependent on the type of roadway, the speed, the volume, um, the width, and then a, the general acceptance from the town. And I say that because the, the best example I have for that is Route 1 and going through Ipswich. Um, they have the slow flashers at one driveway, then a quarter mile away, they have another slow flasher, and then another mile away, they have a speed limit sign over by um, where Linebrook is. Eventually, when you get like eight of those in a row, people stop paying attention um, to them. So you also don't want to do too much because mm -hmm. people will stop paying it. People will start disregarding. Um, it's the reason why we don't put stop signs in the middle of neighborhoods, for instance, because people, if it's not really warranted, people will not pay attention to them. I'm interested to see what the formal response is back to TEC from uh, um, for two TEC from GPS. Can you get them all straight? <laughs> yeah, all the initials. <laughs> yeah, right. So I think I'll probably have more questions once that happens, but um, I think maybe I'll just reserve my questions until then. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll have more. Mm -hmm. To that issue, we have really two choices we could do. We could certainly, uh, Heather would be happy to, to generate a response, you know, as quickly as possible and to give time. And we could certainly meet in two weeks to focus on the response letter. Or what we could do is hold off, to start our civil discussions in the first week, and then it comes assuming that maybe we're lucky enough to be in this sort of same position, take advantage two weeks later of bringing both to discuss the peer review letter here and any follow-up to civil at the second November meeting, which we've already tentatively scheduled out. So I'm just offering up two different ways to approach it, uh, respecting everybody's time um, as well. So we, we don't mind pushing that off to follow up to this discussion, certainly at the second meeting in November, if that's better for the board. I thought you weren't going to be here tonight. I think I had it no, mixed it up. No, the 15th. Yeah. Okay. But if we have a problem in November on the second meeting date, as it's being somebody's not going to be here, we're certainly happy to come back here in two weeks and do this. I was just <coughs> offering up an alternative to give you guys some choices. And Actually, the idea the is not the conflict is October. The oh, second the October. meeting in October. So that's oh. what we were sort of yeah. discussing, so. trying to figure out. So that may be better off that we just do that. And then, like I say, we're not looking to skirt that. We would come here, do civil first week in November, and then the second two weeks later, we could do follow up to traffic and follow up to civil at the same meeting. The civil and the traffic tomorrow. Yeah, yep. that's what mm -hmm. I was thinking too. And that way our engineer could present and discuss the issues and questions we're rec recommending to the site as part of the civil. And that still gives the consultants the chance to come back and follow up to see that we address those and what have you. Do regular s uh, to do the civil on the first <coughs> November date, which is November sixth. Thank you, November sixth, and that would make the second one the twentieth. Mm -hmm. um, oh, good. Okay, so Thanksgiving's the next week. I was thinking it was going to bump nice. into Thanksgiving. You know where everybody leaves. Yep. Of course, that depends on your both availability in November. November 20th. I thought it would be for Thanksgiving as well. Although <laughs> no, yeah, no, I know. No, I'm no, like, no, I don't no, want to no, meet the Wednesday before no, Thanksgiving. No. Nobody's going to come. So, but but the 20 the 28th is Thanksgiving. So, um, 
so I won't forget you. So I'm sorry, I, I think I missed that. Are, are you available? But how? Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess the other question is: Do we expect to have anything else to to go over? At I mean, John won't be here for the second October, October eight, which I don't think we uh, have. And anything. if it's only the you know to review, continue on this, it's probably not worth it if he's not here. Right. Because so you unless there's something else that we have to. Right. You don't want to take testimony yeah. if he's not going to be here because right. that's a meeting that he'll miss. Mm -hmm. Even though we filed any applications yeah. with the board that will put us on the application as of right now. That yeah. was going to be my next yeah. question. <laughs> have we received anything <coughs> yet? But they still have until next Thursday to to, to submit. To submit. Correct. So um, but for this quorum, I wouldn't I wouldn't continue to right. spend if he's not going to be here. Yeah. Okay. So, sounds like a plan. So, November 6th, civil. Correct. And then November 20th, uh, civil and traffic follow-up. Well, follow-up for traffic, definitely. I'm and sure it could we'll be travel for civil and, civil. and we might decide at the end of the civil meeting on November 6th to discuss what other peer review and how we're going to deal with those things yeah. at that mm -hmm. time. Because I think civil in itself will, will help you all to understand the site and the issues and the drainage. and. So that will sort of maybe drive to the what would be appropriate next. Okay. And so, well, they're going to make a motion, but we, what? I'm sorry. What? Counts. Continue to the sixth. Yes. Yes. Also. Well, we also want to do the the architect review. Right. So uh, we do have one other. We did get a um, couple of proposals for architecture. Architectural review. We did you? Shared with the yeah. So we did want to sort of go over that as a board, but if you guys have comments or questions about those, no, we were fine. Okay. Okay. So we can continue on. If you want. It's up to you. If you want to hang out for that? We got two proposals. But I don't want to make a motion to continue. So we review this stuff first. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's what I agree. What are the two pros? We know one's from Cube. Cube three, it looks like. Cube three. three. We, have two, <coughs> we have two proposals. One from Sam Architect, which was originally discussed at the meeting. Oh, the original one, one correct. They which said that they would be revising it based upon the comments that would be more exterior review, massings, et cetera. They brought their price down. I was able to get in contact with Cube 3. I did make other inquiries. I was unable to get anybody else, but Cube 3 submitted a proposal. So they're both submitted to the board. <coughs> and both of us rely on whether or not they'll included prices for attendance of meetings. Okay, and price-wise, they were saying the scope was, was generally? $100 off yeah. here. Yeah. Sam yeah. was still outside the scope a little bit. Because they didn't include any meetings or anything of that nature, whereas Cube 3 included two meeting, uh, two meetings, one with me, which would be unnecessary, and then one with the board. Yeah, I was going to say, if, you, if you're giving us just before you guys go into discussion, Cube 3 would be our preference, but I realize that that's... I figured you'd have comments, so. <laughs> I have you known me long enough to know now? You yep. know, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. And Sam would be under a, under the TEC subcontractor effectively, so TEC would be also helping coordinate some of that, whereas Cube 3 would be independent. Any opinions on that? I want to start down there. <laughs> Get there. Cube 3 is, well, I know you had a, yeah. Cube 3 is for 144, right? This proposal is to check out 144. So are they going to charge more? 
if it's 192. Well, I, I did look at that too because uh, where's the copy I was working on? on this is Rebecca's. Yeah. Yeah. More than Sam. Yeah, that, that was really the only thing I noticed of any real significance, to be honest. So, well, Sam address both. Yeah, so if you actually go to page four of their proposal, um, they do talk about uh, page four, section B. Um, they talk about how they would do a comparison and massing between mm -hmm. two proposals, 192 units versus the 144 subunits. So mm -hmm. I felt like it. Yeah, that's um, really only relevant on the architecture side to the massing, not to the design, because they'd be right. similar. So, but they did include that. They did hear what we had to say, and mm -hmm. they didn't just do the 144. Although it looks like that, if you look at the first page of it, it looks like it's right. only one, but it's, they do include it as part of there. <coughs> did you guys have any comments on that? <coughs> or anything else you'd like them to look at, at no. as opposed to what they proposed, any cha you know, changes to it or no. anything like that. So they are specifically excluding floor plan review, unit configuration review, ADA, FHA compliance, 40 planning, zoning requirements compliance. They're excluded. Right, that's what, so that's what I was bringing to attention, yeah. that they're excluded. So. Um, <coughs> so far, these yeah, guys exclude a lot. Well, that was my these question. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, hmm. The cube seems to be excluded. Isn't that the whole idea? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it That's kind of why. Oh, well, it's not the. meeting we had with the applicant had stated that that was outside of their purview to review. Yeah. Interior, all of those. I thought the. Well, ADA is required. By code, right? It doesn't have to be reviewed, well, right? It, but it doesn't have to be done by this board, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. right, exactly. So, uh, but I thought the 40B was really about the, the design aspect and how it fit in the community and the space sizing more than, yeah, you know, nothing to do with the internal floor plans. No, and how no, all you that. can't. Yeah, right. um, it's really more design review than architectural review. Yeah. Um, the only question I would have is the 40B compliance yeah. review, which I'm assuming they mean Looking at the layout compliance of the, of the project, yeah. not compliance of what they've, their part, the architectural yeah. part of it. But they didn't explicitly say that. So. Well, 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 I'd say the same with the That's cruel and zoning it. compliance. This yeah. is, these are their deliverables. Well, zoning yeah. compliance is also not this one. <laughs> under that either. What I would like them to do. Right. Right? Strictly, the, the architectural side of the 40B, from my understanding, is literally about how the design of the buildings fits in the community. Okay. There's nothing to do with the size or any of the, the standard zoning considerations. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I think that zoning compliance is something you're going to want from your civil peer review. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily think you need it as part of a design peer review. True. Well, I guess the only problem with that is if you run into uh, <coughs> if you run into comments regarding the massing, they'll need to know the height, things like that. The zoning, they'll they'll mm -hmm. need to have some kind of knowledge of the zoning, um, and whether different variances and different waivers are required. I, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I, 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 <laughs> We want to get more clarification on the exclusions. How do the exclusions are based upon the conversation and the minutes that were done at the last meeting? I, they, the board knew this and watched the video, but we went through the same one and we literally checked off, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and I gave them, this is what the board wants, and they gave me exactly what you all had mentioned at that meeting. So if there's specifics, I can obviously go back to them, but the reason that you're seeing those exact exclusions is because mm -hmm. those were exactly what the board had gone through with the same one when we originally reviewed the proposal. So that's, it's not out of the blue, it's not, you know, yeah. it was more of, so they were trying to give you what you were asking for. Well, we have a right to change our mind, right? You do. <laughs> 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 well, I, I'm under the, the uh, 
assumption that the ex exclusions are scoped to stuff outside of the, the review itself, not necessarily just generally we're not going to consider the zoning requirements or 40B compliance. They don't consider 40B compliance as part of the scope. That's actually their problem. That, that's what, right. uh, <laughs> they would know that from Mass I'm sure Mass Housing would tell you that you're not in compliance, right? Yeah, basically. Okay. So. No, they wouldn't. No. So. But for your recommendation, would you oh. try to see if we could try to get them to do the 40B? So is there a huge this difference isn't in the on price? for your November 6th oh, meeting yes, yeah. or for your November 20th meeting? Oh, no, I think November 6th or November 20th, right? Probably want to delay this a bit anyway. I was going to say, get I thought a little more clarity time on this. Okay. Get that clarity, anyways. All right. It's not, I mean, it's not going to delay the right. review because it's not set to go on until sometime in December now. Good point. Probably later Wait than that. Wait until the 6th and, and then ask them in the meantime to revise their proposal. Can you just for the record, can you just get some clarification on exactly what you're asking them to clarify so I can reiterate that to them? Sure. You need to brief the swamp. I'm, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't just didn't hear what you said. Um, you tell us thoughts on the uh, council for the project. Um, why don't you give a fair comparison? Two, three, scope is a scope that's appropriate for this review. So why don't you just cut and paste two, three scope and give it, so you have your comparison, comparing apples and apples. I'm not as sure you think it is appropriate though. Right, I, I think right. What, what she's saying is- Right, this is cube three I'm talking about. So that's the one I'm debating. So I'm not you saying- think they meet the, I could, we couldn't tell who was talking about. Oh, that's all right, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in the cube three proposal, right they have specific exclusions. And so that's sort of what caught the red flag right. for me. The exclusions were floor plan review, which seemed appropriate. Unit configuration review, which seemed to be, we discussed that. Right. Uh, ADA FHA compliance, which we sort of just discussed, that's yeah. code. Right. But uh, 40B compliance, they are excluding that. And Groveland planning zoning requirement compliance. Uh, I'm not sure what they mean by 40B yeah. compliance. That's what I'm well, asking. I think you that's generally the correct. Project, right. Would be appropriate, but that's going to be on the plan. I, I would that's think. That's also zoning. I would think to it, any suggestions that your design reviewer makes in terms of potential changes sh certainly should consider their impact on the zoning. Mm -hmm. Right. So, to the extent that that's an exclusion that would prevent them from doing that, that Obviously, yeah. they're, they're constraining themselves a little too much. Uh, uh, but I don't think they need to do a, yeah. you know, a whole zoning analysis no, to tell no, you whether right. or not the... You know, and that's, that's, what I that's what you're going to get from your civil peer review. Would probably scope the exclusion to, to be to cover 40B compliance outside of the design review as well as any zoning requirements outside of their actual scope of review. Is TEC doing the civil? Yeah. Yes. yes. So then... You probably want to go with Sam because they're a subcontractor of TEC. So if TEC is going to be doing all the civil, they can then have sort of work. Hand they in can hand. work together. Well, we could decide that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't if think we've seen Sam's uh, revived. I forwarded it to the applicant. Um, well, he, you know, he's a bad bureaucrat. So I forwarded it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's actually a pretty short. But I think you have apple proud. Addendum to. I mean, again, you know, if you're saying we're going to, you're going to sign November well, 6th, I, have another I, I think, I think the point is that if they go with Sam, they'll be able to coordinate yeah. better so that there is no overlap. Yeah. I like that I idea. think they're going to coordinate with anybody to be honest, uh, but that's okay. I well, I'm not sure necessarily that, that TEC and, and Cube 3, who are you know, would be separately contracted, sure. would work as closely as Sam and, and Tech, when Tech is retaining Sam as a subcontractor. I'm not suggesting that they tell you what to do. The Sam thing, the revised Sam, is much more appropriate. Okay. Okay, so the question for us is do we want to make a decision on this or defer until November 6th for Paul's suggestion? Or do we know what we want to do now and just 
I mean, we can finalize this even if we don't yeah. necessarily. I mean, my, I would recommend probably delaying the review until yes. we actually get through a little more of the civil and the high discussions with stuff, but. Agreed. So this is more of just a selection yeah. so they can start looking mm -hmm. at stuff and mm -hmm. that's all. Um, okay. By the way, can I have this copy just while it's in my hand? Do you need it back? I don't need it. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so someone want to make a motion about what you want to do? Are we going to continue this? <coughs> Well, it's it, that's a question. Do we want to choose Sam now, or, or Q3 now, or see if we can see about getting some clarity on the Q3 one, and then deciding later, or just choose Q3? But the I mean the. I, I sort yeah. of feel the same way. I, yeah. I've been leaning, I I'm leaning for Sam. I, yeah, the, I, I did I was read them prior to. I was kind of leaning towards Sam last time, too, to be honest, because yeah. I like the, 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 the um, collaboration between the two. A motion? Yeah, please. We, uh, I'll make a motion that we accept Sam Architecture to do the review. Motion check. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Now we can get the information to them. They can get started. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'd like to wait is to really right. Right. Yeah. Sure. Get a little more clarity on the actual layouts of the buildings. Okay. And so I would like to make a motion to continue this public hearing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Public hearing until. Wednesday, November 6th, 7.30, which we will review civil, the civil portion of the project. Seconded. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Again, thank you all very much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. And we have the vote for Sam. Before the break, so we don't vote on nothing on Sam. I'm assuming Rebecca got that. If not, it's a video. Yeah. You have that motion we made to accept Sam? Yeah. He was very soft spoken. I, yes. was, I wasn't not sure like you could actually hear him. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thank you very much you. for coming. Thank you. you too. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah, I, I get Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I got a better vibe out of this. Yeah, I'm out here. Yeah, I, I like your numbers. We're not doing this. We're not yeah. Because I, I, I like the fact that, you know, Sam and Tech can play off each other a little together. bit. Yeah. I think they can save time. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be at that. Monday at what time? Yeah. 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 The water and sewer. Is that it? Or am I got yeah. the other? Denise, Denise had asked me to go because they have a water and sewer. Okay. Other business? Minutes. Minutes from September 4th. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have a good night. <coughs> so did everyone read the minutes? Yes, ma'am. Them. <laughs> but did you read them previously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. For September 4th. Mm. Anyone have any uh, changes, suggestions, questions? You're the editor. I am Fine. not an editor, so. Yeah. so I, I mean, no grammatical corrections at all. <laughs> did you say you had a correction down there? I'm sorry. No, I no. said I, may, I mean, no grammatical corrections. No. Oh, okay. Um, no, actually, I had none. 
I will uh, make a motion to accept the uh, minutes from the Wednesday, September 4, 2019 meeting. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Rebecca. As always. Anything else? Open discussion? Open discussion. The only discussion oh. item I have is the um, invoice that was provided by TEC for the original or beginning review of the um, I think I just saw that. 2019 3 4 Street application. Yeah, this one right here. Is this it? Yeah. No. So, so they want us to pay this. Paperwork is getting out of hand. Okay, so um, the question: I, there are enough funds in the account yes, to pay this at this. Okay. They put in the full proposal for TEC, which I believe was thirteen thousand something. So we definitely have enough money money in the account to pay the initial bill. Okay. Then I will make a motion to approve the invoice from TEC. Uh, invoice number 15639, dated 930, 2019, uh, in the amount of $2,840. I will second, second that. It. All those in favor? Aye. 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 $2,840? Yes, that's part of the contract price. Yes. It's like their initial. Yep. That's for the check, right? Yes. First payment. Yes. And then the only other item I have is just kind of a, um, an announcement. I had sent you all an email about the Elm Square downtown survey. Mm -hmm. Just to bring it up again at a public setting, we had received a $15,000 grant from the Massachusetts Downtown Initiative Program to look at the economic conditions of our downtown and see whether or not uh, we are get into the perspective how we'd like to move forward. What are the market trends? What are the challenges that we're facing? Where is the real estate market going? Uh, also, what would the residents like to see down there? What is, what is it that we should try and be attracting? Um, and as part of that, that survey really comes into play so that we can get a better understanding of exactly what people are feeling and what people want to see um, as they live here, visit here, et cetera. So I'd really appreciate it if you could take a second to fill out that survey and or pass it along to any family or friends yes. or anybody that does visit the square because it really is very, very important because the plan will not reflect what the town wants if the town doesn't tell us what they want. What is the time frame? Right when do you need it by? Uh, the sooner the better, because the numbers are pretty low right now. So yeah. I, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. I already did mine. Oh, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Um, but I was wondering, I did have a question about that. Is it out on the town website so that everybody can get to it? Yes, it's on the town website. It's on the town Facebook page. It's on the Twitter page. Um, I've put around a couple of flyers around um, town hall and other areas that have a QR code. So it's an easy thing of just taking your phone and taking a snapshot of the QR code and going right to the survey right on your phone so you don't have to worry about going to a link or get extremely user friendly. And I took it was like five minutes, not even. So it was pretty yeah, simple. No, pass it to the so, kids. Yeah. Because we're after them, that'll build the numbers up anyway. So I'm, I'm sure my kids would have some great ideas on what to put downtown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, anything else open? Else? So, Rebecca, she said no further applications that we know of coming no in. No further applications as of now, but like Kathy had mentioned, we have until the yeah. 10th for them to submit financial and perspectives. But it, I would imagine that somebody would have come in in, in some way, shape, or form with an idea that or they wanted to have, have yeah. it. So Nothing with the restaurant yet? Uh, they're still before the planning board right now, um, so they have not um, made any headway there. And the other one was the one on 895 Salem, I think was the number. Um, and I believe they're still in design phase and have filed a RDA or ANRAD with the Conservation Commission. Right. So they're still in the design mm -hmm. the enabling what their layout's going to be. So I don't anticipate them coming before us you know, for the October and or November meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. At 9.04 p.m. Seconded. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. It's just weird. These meetings are going faster than the other meetings we have. I can't believe nobody in town is coming <laughs> to these meetings. Are we